Thank you for listening to this message from Simple Truth Gospel with Kiria, a teaching ministry that teaches the Word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to Simple Truth Gospel. I hope you had a wonderful week. Today, we will continue our study to the book of Hebrews. We will cover chapter 6. Before we continue, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for making it possible for us to come together this morning to glean from your word, to study your word. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, our lips with singing. Father, we pray that through your word, you will turn around our captivity. That through your word, you will help us to be liberated from anything that holds us in bondage. Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit, you will minister to everyone listening simultaneously. The Holy Spirit, you know what we need. Give us revelation, knowledge, understanding. Give us sound mind to receive what you are going to teach us today. We always purpose not to be hearers only, but doers of the word of God. So we pray that you will enable us, Holy Spirit of God, empower us to pull into action the things that we have heard from the word of God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us not to backslide. There are so many things in the Word tempting us every day. But I pray that you will help us to continue to abide in Christ. And His words abide in us. You've done so many things for us. We cannot count them. We are very grateful. Your goodness, your mercy, they endure forever. Blessed be thy holy name. With one voice we say, all glory, honor, power, majesty, dominion belong to you forever and ever. In the name of Jesus Christ, everybody said, Amen. My good friends, I welcome you to today's teaching. We are going to cover Hebrews chapter uh, uh, 6. We're almost halfway to the book of uh, uh, Hebrews. And uh, let me tell you about uh, some excuses that people gave to the police when they were pulled over for over speeding. <laughs> One of them said, Officer, my car is uh, a V8 car, it has a V8 engine. You try stopping it. <laughs> And the other one said, uh, I had to get ahead of you. That's why I was speeding. And another man said, I bought a new pair of shoes. And they are heavy. So the shoe kept pressing on the gas. <laughs> Good friends, there are so many reasons that we give as Christians for not studying the word of God. Sometimes we say that we are very tired. We come back uh, uh, very late. And sometimes we say there is no light. So whatever the excuses are, part of uh, spiritual maturity is to grow from excuses to no excuses. It's to grow from excuses to I will study to show myself approved. I will abide in the word of God. And as you do this, the word of God will dwell in you richly. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to go ahead and start. And I will uh, 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 read verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the, fundament, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of the doctrine of baptisms, 
of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. So you see the, uh, the word here, therefore, and like I always say, anytime you see therefore, find out what is therefore. So this is a continuation of thought from last week when we started chapter 5. Remember last week towards the end, uh, uh, the author of the uh, book of Hebrews start, started telling the audience, those he was writing to, to get past the fundamental principles of the oracles of God, which means he encouraged them to grow, to attain to spiritual maturity. The Bible originally was not written in chapters and in verses, so it, it, they were written in scrolls. So the book of uh, Hebrews would have been one scroll, you know, all the way uh, 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 from the beginning to the end. It was about uh, 1227 that uh, Archbishop of uh, Canterbury, um, uh, Stephen Langton, divided the Bible in chapters and in verses for easy referencing. And uh, it was not inspired. You can tell because uh, sometimes you will see a thought will end abruptly and then in a chapter, and then when you get to the next uh, chapter, it will continue the same thought. So that's what is happening right here. Uh, he continues to talk about what he was saying from chapter 5. So he says, in the, he's talking to them now, do not go back to Judaism. You have come to faith in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to get past the basics. And those basics, he told us what it is, the basics. He says, the laying on of, of hands. The believing that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. Believing that he died. Believing that God raised him from the dead. Believing that he's coming back again to raise us. And also, he will judge the world. So he wants us to get past this level of Christianity and uh, uh, put on our maturity shoes. This applies to every one of us. It's not only talking to uh, the, the Jews. It's talking to every Christian. The only way that we can get past this elementary stage of Christianity is through the Word of God. We cannot pass it through human traditions and rituals. No, we cannot. We can only pass it through the revelation that the Holy Spirit of God will put in us, the opening of the Word of God to us. But we got to, first of all, study. we got to put our nose in the Word of God. And as we do, revelation upon revelations will come. The Holy Spirit will open the eyes of our understanding. And he will uh, break the word of God down to us. So, as Christians, we need to know the whole counsel of God. There are churches that are uh, reluctant in, to teach um, the Old Testament. You know, they will tell you that those things are past. But remember, you cannot understand the whole counsel of God if you don't learn from Genesis to Revelation. Because in that Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Now, in the New Testament, we have the Old Testament revealed to us. Just like Paul speaking to the elders of Ephesus at Miletus, he said to them, I have not shown to declare unto you the whole counsel of God, the whole counsel of God. My good friends, the more we study the word of God, the more we know the word of God, the more we are enlightened, the more we grow in our faith, the more we are made strong through the word of God, the more we can overcome trials and tribulations because we know what the word of God says, the more we can be able to face the challenges that will come to our life 
Because as long as we are in this world, we are not pruned. We are not immune from having trials and tribulations and uh, challenges. They are part of our Christian work. So through the word of God, we are equipped every day. We are made stronger and stronger to be able to live a life of victory in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse um, 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tested the heavenly gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tested the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. Remember that Paul was writing. You see, I keep saying Paul uh, sometimes. So understand that when I say Paul is my own personal opinion, I believe that Paul wrote this letter. Uh, so if you hear me say Paul, uh, and you don't believe that, don't be offended. It's just a personal opinion. So uh, Paul wrote this letter to Jews who came to faith in Christ Jesus. But because they were being persecuted, uh, they started to drift back to Judaism, to the offering of animal sacrifice to cover their sins. To rituals and human traditions. Here he tells them one of the consequences of uh, drifting back, of uh, rejecting Jesus Christ. And uh, remember all this while he's been talking to them and say, grow in your faith. You are just like a baby Christian. I want you to mature to the word of God. So now he will introduce one mature doctrine to them. And this is the doctrine of the sin unto death. You know, you've heard about sin unto death. We see this in, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. As a matter of fact, let me read it to you so it will refresh our, uh, our memory. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning in a sin, which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about it. So what is sin unto death? Uh, in my book, the title titled uh, Embracing a New Beginning, I spoke about, um, I wrote about um, sin unto death in detail. So uh, if you get hold of that book, uh, you will have more information. But in a simple dis uh, definition or explanation, sin unto death simple means the rejection, willful rejection of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. So the sin unto death can only be committed by a believer. Now look at this in context here. Paul is writing to those who came to faith in Christ Jesus, but they were drifting back. So the sin unto death can only be committed by someone who already a Christian. He's not talking to unbelievers here. There are some who believe that sin unto death is uh, talking about those who are not believers. No, no. He's talking about those who are believers already. Now, it is not talking about missing the mark. Uh, when we miss the mark, uh, 1 John chapter 9, uh, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 tells us what to do. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's what you do when you miss your mark as a Christian. So many Christians today believe that they committed a sin unto death. And this is the modus operandi of the enemy, Satan and his demons. They will try to put that thought in your mind. And they will put you into condemnation. They want you to believe that you, whatever you did can never be forgiven. 
But that is not true. So we don't listen to what the enemy is saying. As a matter of fact, whenever you are worried about something that you did that was wrong, it simply means that you've not committed a sin unto death. In sin unto death, there is no remorse. <laughs> no, there is no regret. If the Holy Spirit of God is convicting you that what you did was wrong, that you need to repent, means that you are still a child of God. All you need to do is to get back into fellowship. So, here, he tells us the criteria for committing sin unto death. So let's go over that. It's here uh, uh, um, from verse 4 to uh, uh, verse 6. I read it a while ago. So, first of all, it has to be a deliberate act. A willful act. So if somebody would corner you and then put a gun to your head and say, if you don't say that I, I reject Jesus Christ, I'm going to blow your brains up, off. And then you, because of fear, you say that. That doesn't mean that you committed a sin unto death. It was not a, a willful uh, decision. Somebody forced you to say those words. That is number one. Number two, it has to be someone who is born again and tested the heavenly gift. So you see, tested the heavenly gift. Who is the heavenly gift? Jesus Christ. So they must be born again first. And number three, they must be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Number four, they must know the word of God. So it means they are enlightened. They know what, they, they're not baby Christians. They know what the word of God says for real. Number five, they must operate in the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is what it says here, that uh, tested the power of the age to come. That's the operating in the gift of the Holy Ghost. If anyone who meets this criteria here, all of a sudden they say, I don't want nothing to do with Jesus Christ any, anymore. It tells us there, we just read it. It says, you cannot pray them out. I do not say that he should pray about that. There's nothing he can do about it. The reason why you cannot pray them out is because the decision they made is a willful decision. It is the choice they made. Remember, God created you and the I as free moral entities. We make the choice to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the only way you can be born again. Born again cannot be by force. It has to be that you make that choice to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. The same way you make the choice to receive him as Lord and Savior, you can also make that choice to reject him. We continue in verse um, 7. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and bears hearts, useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. I want to show you something uh, from what we just read now. You see, the word of God brings blessing to us. If we hear the word of God and we do what the word of God says, we bear fruit. And these fruits that we bear benefits us and also people all around us. We are the epistle that the word read. The people of the world, this is what they read. They will read our words and they will read our actions. Through our words and through our actions, we can bring people into the kingdom of God. In other hands, if we hear the word of God, we don't put the word of God in practice. 
Not only that it does not benefit us, but it will also hinder unbelievers from coming to faith in Christ Jesus. What is the summary of what we just read? Be that one that bear fruit. Fruit of righteousness, the fruit that will not only be beneficial to us, but also to the people around us. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 9. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name. In that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit their promises. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, after warning them from uh, not to backslide, he brings in words of encouragement. He says, I know you will not backslide, but I trust God that you will continue to make spiritual progress. <laughs> he continues to talk about now the rewards. The rewards that will come to those who advance the kingdom of God. Remember the Bible tells us that we all will stand in the judgment seat of Christ. The beamer seat. And everyone will be rewarded based on what they did in the body. So there is a reward that is coming to us. Based on the way we advance the kingdom of God. That's what Paul is writing here now. He's reminding us about that reward. That it is coming. So... Now we are talking about uh, advancing the kingdom of God. Let us talk about ways that you can advance the kingdom of God. Number one, you want to be that one who fulfills the mandate that Jesus Christ gave to the church. When he said, go into the whole world, preach the gospel to every creature. Utilize every opportunity that you have to Minister the gospel to someone around you, your colleagues at work, family members. Even though sometimes family members, they are the hardest people on earth to minister to. <laughs> are you hearing me? <laughs> but keep on ministering to them. Use every opportunity. Do not say or give excuses for, the, for, to, for that one that you are about to minister to. Don't say, I don't like the way his face looks or her face looks. It looks like they're going to say no. <laughs> no, my good friends, do not make that decision for them. You see, our own job, our own duty is to preach the gospel, spread the good news. Now, it is the Holy Spirit of God who will take what you say to them and convict them of the one sin, the sin of rejection of Jesus Christ. And then, through that conviction, some of them will be brought into the kingdom of God. You and I, we cannot save anybody. It is wrong for you to say, I saved that one. No, you couldn't and I cannot. Rather, a better way to say is, I led him or her to Christ. It is an opportunity. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the one who does the whole thing. No one can come to the Son except that is drawn to Him. No one comes to the Father except that is drawn. So the only way that we can come to the Father is through the power of the Holy Ghost. He's the one who does the work, not us. Number two, you can advance the kingdom of God by uh, sponsoring the ministry. You know, the gospel is free of charge, but it takes money to take it to the world. 
to be on the radio, on the television, to print Bibles and uh, spiritual materials that will help people grow, it takes money. So, you can advance the kingdom of God by finding out those ministries that are, are involved in spreading the gospel, the genuine ones. And then you can sponsor them financially. Bible tells us that he that receives a prophet in the name of God shall receive the prophet's reward. So whatever reward they will receive, because they are the one that went and preached the gospel there, you will be a partaker of that reward because you are the one who sent them there, made it possible for them to go there to your financial assistance. That is another way we can advance the kingdom of God. So when you give into the ministry, make sure it is on a good ground. Do not do your research. Find out what this ministry is up to, what they have done in the past, and, and what they believe. I will not put a dime of my money to a church that teaches about human rituals and human traditions, that they are not based upon their gospel, the word of God, I will not put my money in any church that Jesus Christ is not the center of it. I don't care what name they go by. No. So you got to do your research, my good friends, before you sow, so that when you sow in a good ground, when it, the harvest come, it will be abundance of harvest. Blessed be the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number three way that you can... Um, Advance the kingdom of God is by your prayers. There are some of us, including myself, we tell other people, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. We are not the only ones who need prayers. Remember Paul wrote in his letters, he will say, pray for us that we will preach the gospel boldly. Pray for us that we will be delivered from the hands of evil people. For not all men have faith. So, your ministers, the ones that minister to you, <laughs> they need prayers as well. Pray for them because they are the uh, target of the enemy. You remember that Satan wants to strike the shepherd so that the sheep will uh, 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 everywhere scatter. So we pray for them. There are so many things they're going through that they don't tell you. Pray for your ministers. Pray for one another. Other church members. There are those who don't believe that they can intercede for themselves. Intercede for them. Pray for the body of Christ. That we may be united in Christ. That we may grow spiritually every day through the word of God. Now, he says, let your motivation, if you're going to be advancing the kingdom of God, let what motivates you be the love of Christ, the love of people. If you have any other ulterior motive, you will not have any rewards. Because the rewards, you will receive them here on earth. Jesus wants us to not to lay our, our treasure here on earth. We are rust and mud will corrupt. We are teeth will break in and they will steal. But he wants us to lay our treasures in heaven. Where it's protected. If you are in the ministry, or you are advancing the kingdom of God just to be seen and be praised by men or by women. Oh, my friend, I tell you, you've already received your reward right here on the earth. If you are in the ministry just to be popular, to, so that people will know who you are, <laughs> change that mentality today. Let what motivates you be that you love Jesus Christ and you love the people God created. He continues to encourage us. He says, while you are doing, advancing the kingdom of God, there will be trials, tribulations. There will be distractions. He says, but I want you to be, do not, he says, I want you not to be wary in well-doing because in due season you will reap if you do not faint. 
The time is very short. Do not allow yourself to be distracted. Be focused as you are advancing the kingdom of God. There are so many distractions that will come from your family members, from your friends, from the world around us. But when you see those distractions coming, those trials, those tribulations, those persecutions coming, stand bold and say, I will not give in. For I am not moved by what I see or by what I hear, but I will move by what the word of God says. Stand bold and say, Jesus already gave me a clue when he told me that in this world that I will have tribulation, but I should be of good courage for he has overcome the word. Be bold and say, Paul wrote that those who live in, who, who live in this world will suffer tribulation. So when these trials and tribulations, uh, these distractions are coming your way, do not give in. But rather be strong. And then he continues, he says, while you are doing it, make sure that uh, faith and patience, they are not left behind. <laughs> Which means uh, you have to be patient while you are doing what you are doing in faith. You want to be like Abraham and the saints of old. Those who through uh, faith and patience inherited the promises of God. My friend, let me give you one advice. As you advance the kingdom of God, do not run out of patience. Because whenever, any point, at any time that you, you, you run out of patience, means that you've come to the end of your faith. They go hand in hand. We continue in verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all disputes. Thus, God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. We begin to delve in into uh, the authenticity of God's word. In other words, we have been reminded here that God is not a man who should lie or son of man that he should repent. That whatever he says he will do, he will do it. It tells us here that God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. And this is the reason why we should have our confidence in him. We should trust him with all our hearts. This is why it's very imperative for us to pray scriptures when you pray. When you are about to pray, find out what the word of God says about what you are about to pray for. It is very important. Because God will always watch over his word to perform it. So it is important that we approach God in our prayer, uh, 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 what he says in his word. With what he says in his word. You know, take words with you and return unto him and say, take away iniquities. Receive us graciously that we may offer the calves of our lips. When we pray what God says in his word, this is according to his will now, we fulfill the scripture that says this is the confidence we have. And we, when we ask according to his will, he hears us. So that is what Paul is saying here. He's reminding us about the importance of God and his word. That God will always watch over his word 
to perform it because forever his word is settled in heaven. He brings, he gives us an example here with Abraham. He gives an example with Abraham showing that God will always keep his words, his promises. He will always keep them. So Abraham is an example here. You remember God spoke to Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his only begotten son. And Abraham did not disobey God. It took Abraham three days to journey to Mount Moriah, the place where he was to sacrifice Isaac. But in the mind of Abraham, Isaac was dead three days. But now Abraham remember the promise that God made to him when he said, in Isaac shall your seed be called. So he, he says, it means that uh, if I sacrifice him, God is going to bring him back to life. Trusting in God, trusting in what God said to him, Abraham went, went on to sacrifice his own son. And when God saw that Abraham was willing, he said to him, In blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply you. So let's see if God fulfilled the promise that he made to Abraham here. In blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. So the blessing came. Through Isaac, Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ brought salvation now to the whole world. So through Jesus Christ, the whole world is blessed from the lineage of uh, Abraham. Now in multiplying, I will multiply you through Jacob. We have a nation today called Israel standing strong, even in the midst of their oppositions. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So my good friends, it is something worthy of doing to trust in God with all your heart. One man said, faith is like you jumping out of an airplane or 10,000 feet above. Knowing that if God doesn't catch you, <laughs> you are smashed to the end. <laughs> that will be your end. But then he says, how do you know that God will not catch you or will catch you except if you jump? That's what faith is. Leaning on somebody completely, hoping that they don't move. Because if they move, you're going to land on the ground. That's what faith is. So we have to, when we believe God, we must believe with all our heart. Regardless of what we see, regardless of what we hear, because we are not moved by those things. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse 19. I believe it's verse 19. Yes, verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become the high priest from forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Here, he's telling us that Jesus Christ is our anchor. Especially in the troubled world. An anchor for our soul. That we have to depend on the word of God. It is through Jesus Christ and his word that we can be victorious in this word. That we can live in this word as the light and the salt of the earth. It is through Jesus Christ and his word. So Jesus Christ now is our hope. Why is he our hope? Because he seated at the right hand of the Father as we speak right now. Interceding for us. Through his death and through his resurrection, he has now opened a veil for us to come in. You see, where it was impossible in the Old Testament for anyone to come in, Jesus Christ opened that veil 
and say, come on in now, the veil is open. In my name, come to the throne of the Father. My good friends, today we come to that throne of grace by faith. But there comes a day when we will come into that throne face to face. That day is coming. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next year. We don't know. But I have confidence that that day is coming. So in everything that I do, I have this uh, uh, mindset. I have this confirmation that uh, surely there will be an end. My expectations will never be cut off. I have this confidence that uh, God will someday through Jesus Christ, take us out of this place. I have this confidence that the trumpet will sound. I have this confidence that if we are alive when the trumpet sounds, we'll be caught up with those who are dead in the cloud to meet with Jesus Christ in the air. So regardless of what I go through, I'm not moved because I know that the time is very short. And because of this confidence, I will advance the kingdom of God. I will study to show myself approved. I will do the things that are pleasing to God. I will walk in fellowship with him, knowing that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And he died to set me free. And now that I'm free, I am free to serve him with all my heart. To the full, till it overflows. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have come to the most important section of today's teaching. And that is uh, the time that we have the opportunity to be born again. If you are listening to me and you are not yet born again. Or maybe you made a commitment sometime in the past. But you walked away from that commitment. Today is that day that. You can be born again now, and you can come back to Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But you are the one who's going to make the decision to be born again today. If you are not fully convinced within you that if you would die today, that you will spend eternity in heaven, it is important that you do something today. Don't let today pass you by. The time is very short. To be born again means that you turn your life to Jesus Christ. Let go of your good works and your merits. Come as you are. And ask him to be your Lord and your Savior and have relationship with him. I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer right now, you will secure an eternal place in heaven. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe he's your son. He died for my sins. And you raised him from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Now, by faith, I believe that I am born again. I'm a child of God. I believe that my name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Heavenly Father, I give you all the glory for what you have done. Blessed be your holy name forever and ever. Good friends, if you pray that prayer, welcome into the kingdom of God. Please find a good church where they teach the word of God, a Bible-based church, so that you can grow in your faith. Thank you so much for everyone who is a partner with this ministry, who are helping us through their prayers, financial support, and through their services to reach more people. If you would like to become a partner, please go to our website, kuim.org. I encourage you today to be a doer of the word of God. That's the only way you can receive benefits from the word of God. I pray for you today. May the Father be with you and bless you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you sound mind and peace, even in the midst of the troubled world and open doors of opportunities for you. May he heal your body today if you are sick. And may he stand your feet upon that rock which is higher than you. I pray that he will give you wisdom in everything. Wisdom not to make unnecessary mistakes. 
and that he will bless the rest of your week. In the name of Jesus Christ and everybody said, Amen. Regardless of your situation, always know that God is alive and he sits upon the throne forever. Always remember that surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Ganamasoko brakat ki die onkel padeska la pachete. E de gang grande manteri brusco poroko to buje ko padeska la patia. Ala la macra de secura. Thank you for listening to this message from Sacred Truth Gospel with Siri. A teaching ministry that teaches the word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 